Okay, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, our next speaker is John Eric Setsas. John Eric works for Signicat in Norway. He is from Norway. Uh, John is an international speaker and he knows all about fintech, uh, banking. He is an identity architect. I've read that he has even been an assistant professor. So we have a very, very senior speaker. And um, well, John, the floor is yours. All right, thank you. So we are talking about identity. We're talking about decentralized. And um, yesterday I was challenged by Robert to come up here and say what's the biggest challenges on uh, decentralized. And of course, that's uh, what my presentation is going to be about. It's going to be about people issues. Um, looking at this from the people perspective, we've, we've seen a lot of presentations now with use cases. We've seen the technology. We looked at blockchain. We look at policies. But of course, unless people are on board with this, it's not going to work. We need normal people. I said yesterday we are a bunch of identity nerds. Yeah, we are. Sometimes we need to talk to normal people to see what the world really looks like. Okay, so the clicker is uh, clicking. And that's all it does. That's what the clicker should do. It should click, yeah. <laughs> if it could um, go to the next slide as well, that would be helpful. Yep. I, I'm clicking. Should I stop? Yeah, I'm going to stop. Okay, no worries. Just let me know when I can click again. Okay. Oh, that one is working. That one is not. Okay, that's what I was confused. Okay, account recovery. That is an important issue. I mean, how many of you have forgotten a password or lost a key to something or needed to get back into a, a car or a house or an account? We all do that, and we expect that to be in place, right? We people, we forget and we lose stuff. Do we take backups? Nah, we don't. Do we read or follow instructions? And we are careless. And it was interesting that I mentioned yesterday that uh, Phil Zimmerman, the, the guy behind PGP, he had stopped using PGP because he lost his password to his private key. <laughs> well, guess what? I'm in that club as well. We have lost data because there was no data recovery. And we should know better, right? We should create data recovery mechanisms. And, and I'm still thinking, okay, I'm past 60, getting to age, started, you know, thinking, okay, what happens uh, with my, uh, my uh, credentials, access to all my information as I get older, when I start forgetting more. Um, we are used to, if I lose a key, we use, there's always someone to uh, cover my back, right? There's always somebody, I can always call somebody to help me unless there's a digital encryption key. There is no way to get it back unless there's built a scheme, and that needs to be built. And we see all this, well, you need to save these security codes just in case something happens. Yeah, no, people are not going to do that. It's not going to work. We need to build recovery into the system. And of course, that needs a system where you provide your identity in a secure way as you were onboarding to get back into your account. So that's one important issue, one feature we must have for this to fly with people. Next one is the next of kin. Most, most of us will die sooner or later. And what happens then with all our digital assets? We have more and more of them. We have seen examples of cryptocurrencies. I mean, remember this Canadian crypto exchange and he died with a key to the exchange, allegedly? It can't be proven, right? We don't know if somebody else has the key even, right? This is a challenge. How do we handle that situation when I pass away that my next of kin get access to it? Banks already have a really good policy system on this because if I have a bank account or a safe deposit box, right? The banks have the procedures in place 
to validate information that, okay, I've passed away, this individual is my next of kin, and we'll get access to it. We need to implement something like that for this to work. And again, I mentioned banks, and that's why I'm really glad to see RoboBank on the, uh, on the run here with this data keeper, because they have these procedures in place, which is really important. Anonymity, accountability. We had a discussion on these yesterday, and this is a challenging one as well. Of course, we all say, well, we want to be anonymous. I don't want everything I do to be tracked, right? Even if we don't have anything to hide, I mean, that can be taken out of context, and it can look different when you look at it from a different perspective. And most of the stuff I do should be anonymous. You know, if I go to Starbucks and buy a coffee or... That would be a problem, of course, because I don't drink coffee, so that would be a signal, okay, what's wrong with John Eric right now? Um, but you want to be anonymous because we want to be able to speak, uh, speak freely, submit ideas for the diversity, whistleblowing. I mean, mentioned yesterday the, the Facebook case, the latest one now, I mean, Snowden, we all know how to do that, and also not being tracked. But of course, the challenge behind this is, you know, the, all the fake news. What's the source of information? What about illegal activities? What if I do something illegal? What about all the spam and phishing? What if we could know the source of every email we received? Well, spam and phishing would be history, right? And also my statement, if I claim I want full anonymity, well, I also grant that anonymity to anybody stalking my children. And then the problem we discussed yesterday, well, if we create a pseudonymous system, who authorizes the release of the true identity? And this is a challenge. In this country and Norway where I come from, we have a legal system that we trust, so that would work, but that's not true all parts of the world. This is a hard problem. I spend a lot of time struggling with this, and, but we, we need to resolve it. We need to have both anonymity and accountability. And that's also mentioned, the GAIN uh, initiative has been mentioned a couple of times. Uh, this is also mentioned in that one, highlighted, that there is a risk with this anonymity. And of course, we all know with bank transactions, we have the anti-money laundering directive, which is protecting streams of money and being able to know if this is going to terrorist or trafficking. And there's also an ISO standard for looking into this. But these are challenging problems. What about the link between the human and the digital? The link between me and my digital twin, if you like. That's often well established when onboarding, right? When we do an onboarding, you go through a thorough check and you scan your passport and selfie and, and all that. So, the connection between my digital twin and me is pretty good. But who is using that right now? How do I know or how do the recipient know that it's actually me using this account right now? And this exact problem was recognized in Norway last year. I mean, as you know, we're using bank ID a lot for a lot of different purposes. And it's so convenient using the same thing all the time. But they also recognized there were some cases where close relations, it could be a spouse, could be a child, could be a parent or something, that had access to somebody else's phone and would even know their PIN code or passcode to, to access. So regardless of who is actually using it, the receiving end is going to see the owner of the EID. This was recognized in a new financial legislation last year, saying, well, their bank, if the only proof you have is the bank ID, you take the risk, pretty much. So if the value is high, that means banks, they cannot depend on bank ID alone. They will have to add something else. And then we say, well, biometrics solves that problem, right? And I have to show you one of my favorite tweets. Even a three-year-old can hack the biometric system. It's not good enough. We need something that really binds me to an individual, to my digital identity. 
there's been some interesting initiatives. Uh, I sat in on a presentation on something called Heart ID, which monitors your ECG patterns, which are pretty hard to fake. Uh, I saw a paper last week on neurological patterns that analyze the vibrations in your hand, you know, some neuro. So, I mean, there are some initiatives, but this also needs to be solved because unless we can know who's really, that the, it's the owner that's using the wallet right now, well, it breaks apart. I mean, that becomes the weakest link. We need to solve no, when it's John Eric's wallet, it, it's John Eric using it. And I mean, I still have this idea that my device should know it's in my possession. I mean, my, my standard joke on that, if, you know, Jacoba takes my phone now and runs away, the phone is going to say, somebody is running, this is not John Eric, right? He never runs. <laughs> right? And by the way, it disconnects from my watch and, you know, all that. So, but this is still some in the time in the future, but I think this is where we need to get going. We want to be in control, and that's sort of the, the core of this. I want to be in control, and I think sometimes that's being confused with management. Being controlled doesn't mean you have to manage. We cannot put the management responsibility on the users. I want to be in control, but I don't want to manage. I don't want to be responsible if there is a problem. I compare this to my alarm system at my house. I'm in control of it, right? I decide when to turn the alarms on and off. I know when people are entering the house, etc. But I'm not managing. I have a security company that takes care of that. If there's a problem, they will upgrade the devices if you know, I'm not at home and there's a breaking, they will show up or call the fire department or whatever. I think we need to think in those terms here as well. Distinguish between control, I'm in control of the alarm system, and management. Some trusted entity doing the management. And I want somebody to call when there's a problem. And that's becoming harder and harder, especially if your problem doesn't fall within, you know, the predefined uh, categories. So, People want that. We, we need to get in touch with somebody when we have a problem. Another thing we really not need to solve in identity is authorizations. I mentioned uh, parents, children. Uh, when we get el uh, older, we need somebody to do that on our behalf. And typically what happens, in, again, back to Norway and bank ID, is that the child taking care of the elderly parent will get the credentials for the bank ID, which means I will then be using somebody else's bank ID. We need an authorization model, so I will still be using my own, so it's visible, the paper trail, that I'm doing it, but I'm doing this on somebody else's behalf. So we really need a good authorization system as well, both for elderly parents but also for children before they become uh, of legal age and can do this themselves. And also if uh, with people with dis uh, disabilities is a challenge. And of course, these are the easy challenges, the ones I've touched on now. Of course, we have the global challenges that were mentioned yesterday, which are huge, and I'm not going into them again because we talked about them. What about people without identity documents? What about the digital divide, people without uh, smartphones, living in areas without connectivity or electricity, refugees and stateless people. What about the unbanked? And even in Europe, there are unbanked people. How do we handle these in this? They have a right to a digital identity as well. How do we do that? What about available technology? Well, we, I mean, we buy a new smartphone every year and, and can afford it and, and do that, but not everybody does. And what about biometric bias? I can't remember the exact numbers, but I was at the Kepering call and somebody said, uh, the false rates for males in my age was like 3% or something, while for black-skinned females, it was 46%. It was a huge difference in this biometric uh, bias, and that's a challenge as well that we also need to look into. So that was my point, here. I wasn't here to solve any of these problems, I was here to raise them. We need to solve them together as a community, that's why we are here, that's why we get together. A counter recovery, simple mechanisms when people lose their device, or buy a new one for that matter, forget their password, they need to have an easy way to get back in, because more and more of their life is gonna depend on it. 
Next of kin, because we tend to die, we need to hand over the assets to next of kin. Anonymity, how do we handle that challenge? Authorizations, important. The link between me and my wallet in the day-to-day -day usage, knowing it's really me. Control and management, shouldn't be that hard, but we have some trust issues. And the global challenges. Questions? Thank you so much for this uh, great list. Um, uh, what do you think of the dilemma that happens when all of these challenges are seen as burdens to go ahead? Because sometimes I see that these innovative projects, which, which have great ideas about decentralization or, or enhancing privacy, are trying to create the perfect, while the good could also be very good. What is your view on that? I completely agree. I mean, perfect is the enemy of good enough, right? Uh, and it's also what Jaya mentioned in her presentation yesterday, that the reason we have all these security issues now is because they weren't built in from the start. But if we had built them in from the start, we wouldn't have gotten anywhere. So, I mean, we, we need to do both, right? We need to do these experiments. We need to do, you know, the, the, um, uh, the uh, uh, proof of concepts that you're doing. We saw the city of Hague and so on. But we need to have this in mind. So no, we cannot sit down and wait and make a perfect world. That's not going to happen. Which in itself is another challenge. How, how do we, what is good enough? I can't answer that. We, we need to agree, you know, what that is. More questions. Yes, Peter. Uh, you, you talked about uh, that, that your device is fully locked onto you then you are fully trackable. So the Chinese government knows exactly what you do, when, and where you go, what you do. Yeah. That's scary. <laughs> it, it, it is really scary as well, but I mean, it's already like that, almost, right? Because I always carry my device, I leave the signals at all the cell towers and so on. Uh, so the only difference from that and to what I'm talking about is that the device really knows that it's not Jacoba or you carrying it away. So I agree, it's a challenge. We are being tracked, and, and which is also something we should look into. You know, could we do these self tower connections in an anonymous way, just proving a ver verifiable claim that yes, I have paid my phone subscription, so I can make a connection to this cell tower? I don't know, just an idea I just thought of right now. Anyone else questions to John Eric? Okay. Thank you, John Eric, yes. for being with us. <laughs> and see you later in the panel. Um, then we have our next uh, two lady speakers. Lady speakers. Um, Eefje van der Haarst and Sterre de Mreje. Sterre de Mreje is from TNO. Yeah, Eefje is from InnoPay. And they did some research into the spread of identity wallets, if I'm pronouncing it correctly. Sort so, um, <laughs> how many do we have um, and what do they do? So, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Jacobo, for the introduction and uh, ID Next for the, the opportunity to speak here. Um, my name is Evie van der Herst. Uh, I'm team lead digital identity at InnoPay, a niche consultancy firm from Amsterdam specialized in everything that has to do with digital transactions. And co-host is uh, Sterre den Breye, uh, Breyer, that sounds really cool. Uh, from TNO, uh, portfolio manager on SSI. So uh, together with TNO, Inopay, uh, and my colleagues, uh, yeah, did a research on behalf of the Ministry of Interior, the Dutch Ministry, and we want to take you along in uh, our research, our findings, uh, also our recommendations to the Dutch government, and of course, I hope to have some discussions afterwards if that makes any sense. Uh, so, but before we start, I first want to share a bit about the context and approach of this research about, and then Sterre will take over to talk about uh, the self-sovereign identity state of play in the Netherlands, and we will wrap up with a few questions. So, maybe first about the context, huh, because we've heard a lot about self-sovereign identity already today, and 
maybe I think in the last few years, self-sovereign identity has gained a lot of momentum. Eh? So there's a lot of hype going on around SSI, and that sort of urged um, the Dutch Ministry of Interior to, uh, yeah, to sort of get some clarity on what's happening out there. Eh? What, what do we feel about self-sovereign identity? What is our stance? So that is why uh, the ministry asked us to do sort of a exploratory research and sort of to create an overview of what's happening on self-sovereign identity in the Netherlands, but also to show what are the links with the international initiatives. Um, where, are, um, where is a lot happening? In what areas of self-sovereign identity? And what are maybe areas that maybe not get a lot of attention, but should maybe get a lot of attention because of uh, certain public values. Huh? So we see a lot of, for example, a lot of focus on privacy of the user, but maybe not so much about, uh, yeah, what is the impact on um, companies, or what is the impact on security, or what is the impact on inclusivity. So the ministry wanted to have sort of a complete overview uh, so also as sort of a conversation starter to start uh, discussions about policy choices in the future. And they gave us six uh, research questions. I won't uh, bother you with the details, but uh, yeah, that was our assignment. Um, and we used uh, yeah, an approach where we uh, gathered also a lot of input from the markets. I think a lot of people also here in the room have participated in our online survey to give us some input on uh, yeah, with, with what kind of uh, proof of concepts are they experimenting, how they see the future of SSI, what are the main challenges and barriers for SSI. So uh, a lot of that input will also um, follow later in this presentation. And well, together with that input from the market, we've also um, had some conversations with experts and stakeholders and also added a few um, things from desk research we did ourselves. Um, our research was divided in three parts. So we first looked at the Dutch landscape. Uh, then we looked at what are the relevant national and international developments that are impacting that Dutch landscape. And uh, we then also had conversations about yeah, what if the landscape develops in a certain uh, direction, what would that mean? Huh? What would be the impact on public values like privacy, security, inclusivity, etc.? And that resulted, of course, in recommendations. Um, but uh, before we dive into that state of play of self-sovereign identity in the Netherlands, maybe good to also have a sort of a shared understanding about what self-sovereign identity is. And what are we talking about in this research? And that was maybe the hardest part of our research because we, we found that there is no one uh, leading definition of self-sovereign identity. Yeah, of course, we've seen also the principles from Ellen that you mentioned, Ivo, uh, earlier today. Uh, that, yeah, that gives a bit of a feeling about what self-sovereign identity is, but there is not one leading definition. And, uh, yeah, we also didn't create the next definition. But to give some context, what we feel that self-sovereign identity is, or what there is consensus about in the market, is that it's about digital data exchange. It's about doing that via a digital agent or a wallet. And uh, by making sure that the, the organization or the, the entity that has issued credentials uh, is not present in the, in the interaction of the holder once he shares his credentials with a verifier. And so that is the, uh, the, the frame that we are in when we talk about this uh, research. But of course, there are also different ways of sharing data. Eh? Uh, we do that all the time. And also, I think in the PSD2 example showed before, eh, where you share a bank uh, details, uh, you can do that with a normal, old-school digital identity. Eh? You, you sort of get data from the source, and because of it, sen sensitive data, the user needs to give consent, but you don't really need a wallet, and yeah, there, there is no much, not much harm that the issuer is also 
present in the interaction and that he knows where you are sharing your credentials. So there are two different ways of looking at data exchange. And of course, self-sovereign identity was the main focus of our research, but it's good also to realize that there are different contexts where there are different ways that sharing data can take place. I think that was enough to, to share on context and approach. Sterre will take you through the state of play of self-sovereign identity, and I will take over with, uh, I think, the national and international developments. Uh, or the, the yeah. future developments. Yes. Yeah. So, thank you. Uh, so, I will tell about the Dutch SI landscape, our landscape analysis that, that we did. Um, so, we found out that actually a lot is happening in the Dutch SI uh, landscape. How we found it out is what we did, uh, as you, if you mentioned, sent out an online survey to about 50 organizations and 32 people actually filled it in, which was really great. Thank you for your input. Um, but there are more than 50 organizations present in the Dutch SI landscape. There are about, well, more than 90. Uh, we made a small category, like an indexation of what is actually the, uh, the main impact and the main goal of this typical organization in this SI playing field. And Note that this is just a category. It, it, there are many possibilities, but for our um, landscape analysis, this was the most useful one. Uh, so if you're not up here, please let me know, then we'll definitely add you. If you feel you're wrong, please no, say that, because then we'll remove you. That's all fine. <laughs> um, but from this landscape analysis, we found out certain conclusions. And the, the first one is that there are many, many experiments. Uh, but there is fragmentation in the market. Um, so we found out that a lot of people say different things about SSI. So what SSI is, there's no consensus about. Some people mention it's about uh, the 10 principles by Allen. Others say there's the 12 principles by Sovereign. There are people who are saying SSI is a blockchain solution. Others are saying, well, I don't like blockchain, so <laughs> just get rid of it. <laughs> um, but it also means that when you have different ideology on SSI, that your technical implementation is different. Uh, and also, why, why you are doing it? Are you um, researching SSI to actually increase uh, data minimization or increase privacy, or do you want organizations to get more efficient on their data management, on their data processes? Um, and that's also, well, into the technical side, that means that there are different approaches to, do you want to go open source, or do you not want to go open source? What's the business model behind it? And then uh, in the technical architecture, what kind of standards do you use? Do you use attribute-based credentials? Do you use verifiable credentials? Do you DITCOM or don't you use DITCOM? Uh, and that also means that there is fragmentation on the interoperable side, like on the technical uh, perspective on SSI. Um, and that's not only happening in the market, but also within the government itself. So there, uh, for example, the Belasting Dienst is taking a different approach to UVV, for example. And that makes it hard uh, for people to collaborate. What we also found is that there's no critical ma mass yet on SSI. Uh, so we've uh, looked at some wallets, SSI wallets, we looked at uh, some non-SSI solutions, and we compared their active number of users per month. And for the SSI wallets, it's still rather low. Um, that has different um, reasons. There are certain SSI initiatives that are still experimenting. So it's, of course, it's very logical that if you're experimenting, you don't want to get too many users using your platform, storing data in it when it's not ready yet. Um, but it also uh, remains a, a challenge when you have a fragmented landscape to collaborate yeah, together. Um, that also is like a barrier um, when you're not interoperable yet to, to connect to different parties and create a network effect. Um, and for the last part, it's very important that SI is a three-party problem. Maybe not three parties, three role problems. You need issuers, you need verifiers, and you need holders. If you have two of them, then your solution is not ready yet. Uh, that's what a lot of people said in their surveys. Another important uh, thing to mention is that SI concepts are not yet mature enough to uh, get uh, used on a large scale in the Netherlands. The, uh, only one side is that certain um, initiatives are still experimenting, so it's, therefore there's no real uh, critical mass yet. But on the other side, there are 
initiatives or concepts being mentioned that the public needs to have in the SI architecture. For example, guardianship or revocation are topics that are mentioned often. Um, but so far it's not really clear yet how they will impact the SI infrastructure and how they will be solved. Um, and typically these concepts are mentioned often as crucial for SI adoption. And last, um, for the, the first part of the survey, the last uh, conclusion, is there, is there a limited availability for source data? And this source data that is available is limitedly uh, reusable in other domains. Uh, so government, but also private parties, they have a lot of information about customer, about citizens, about uh, clients. Uh, but this data typically is limited to a certain domain. Um, and if you can access your own the data that is about you, and you can reuse it for your own initiatives, for your own uh, well, getting a service request uh, accepted, uh, that might really help the SI adoption. Um, but it's also that there is no verified data available yet, so that others cannot uh, validate it yet. <laughs> I see not the faces there. <laughs> I think that was also one of the things you mentioned. So. <laughs> Uh, so there were the four conclusions on the uh, Dutch SI landscape. Um, of course, there are many other initiatives that are affecting the Dutch SI landscape. So not from the uh, landscape from itself, but also from the outside in. Uh, and I will tell something about that uh, at this moment. So there is not only uh, the, the external developments from the Netherlands, but also on the European level, or maybe even a global level. So on the uh, first side, you have like the policy and regulation. Um, in the Netherlands, but also in Europe. Um, there are many standardization organizations active within the Netherlands, in Europe, but also worldwide. And at last there is Big Tech. And Big Tech is a bit of a strange duck in the pond, or I don't know how the <laughs> expression really is. Um, they're not SI, definitely not SI. Uh, but they have some ideas, and they can affect the playing field in the Netherlands. So they are too important to be left out here. So the first conclusion is here is that it's actually unclear how the different legal frameworks are developed, are, uh, are being under development, uh, will relate to each other. Um, so you have the Wet Digitale Overheid, um, English translation. Dutch Government Act, maybe, is the most literal okay, translation. Okay, uh, sure. <laughs> the, there is the EID regulations, uh, the AIDAS. So how will they compared to each other. And that makes it hard for organizations on the Dutch SSI playing field to actually abide to these like, regulations. Because if they seem to be a bit biting each other, then it's hard to comply to both of them. Um, and it's also often mentioned as one of the barriers. If we don't know what we need to comply to, then it's really hard for us to do so. Um, and because of this overview is lacking, uh, there are no standards yet. Uh, it's really hard to move forward. And then the big tech uh, conclusion. There are many commercial parties that can move much faster than uh, 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 rules and regulation in the Netherlands. And they can dominate the market if we don't watch out. Um, uh, we, sur we heard from the, Dutch, uh, from the survey that a lot of parties actually mentioned it as a big threat to the SSI landscape. Um, because big tech, they, they have a lot of money. They have a huge research and development uh, comp uh, or department. They have a lot of customers, and they can really directly influence the market. Um, but on the other hand, uh, once they are there, they, it's really hard to, well, to get them back to certain regulations that are still under development. It's easier to get the development right first, and then let them take over the market if that's still happening then. <clears throat> um, but another important uh, thing to mention here as well is that Google and Apple, they have these app stores. And if they don't like SI, what can then they do to ban all SI wallets from, the, uh, from their app stores? Is that happening? Would that be happening? Um, uh, so it's really important to keep a uh, notion of the, uh, these big tech organizations. And that were the two conclusions that, uh, uh, for the, um, yes, part B. Indeed. So a lot is happening. Uh, a lot is also 
uh, happening around us that is impacting the SSI playing field. So uh, I think for the ministry, one of the goals also of this research was to get a feel of how is this um, landscape, how could that develop in the future and how would that impact public values? Because as a Dutch government, uh, it, it's not a goal in itself to make SSI a success. Huh? It, it is the job of our Dutch government to make sure that positive effects on public values are sort of strengthened and that negative effects are mitigated. So they wanted to get a feel of how Looking at that landscape, how will that develop and how will that impact public values so they could use that as also conversation starters to make uh, informed policy decisions for the future. So I won't bore you with the details of those scenarios and how they impact those public values in detail. Uh, you can all read that in the report that comes out probably later this month uh, via rijksoverheid.nl.nl. Um, but looking at the two dominant uh, developments, uh, we looked at a, a market that develops from a fragmented market to a more consolidated market. And looking at how will data exchange will, uh, will be facilitated, we looked at will that happen through a digital agent scenario or more um, yeah, with a traditional di digital identity uh, straight from the source. Yeah, so data at the source. So those were the two dominant uh, development areas that we looked at. And um, yeah, from that research, uh, our analysis showed that, well, it depends a bit huh, uh, uh, on the context, what kind of interaction model you would like to facilitate. So in some use cases, it is very relevant to keep the issuer out of the loop in a transaction and to really focus on user privacy and give him all the control he needs to share his data everywhere without having the issuer any knowledge about the transaction. But for other use cases, and maybe Ivo, we are on a different level there because you said we could from a department at the municipality give data to a citizen so he can share it with another department, you could but the question is, should you? Huh? Is that sort of service-minded towards the citizen? Huh? Is sort of uh, um, putting the burden at the citizen instead of getting your own uh, processes in order to facilitate that data exchange? Well, it, it's, I think, a, a discussion we should have together to decide what kind of context requires what kind of digital identity solution. Another thing that we looked at is that, um, as showing from the analysis, that a more consolidated market, so I'm not saying one, uh, uh, one wallet or just five wallets, but a limited number of, of SSI solutions would be beneficial for all actors in the SSI landscape. And so not only for citizens, but also for the issuers and the verifiers. And we also looked, I think, was that Peter, you showed that also with the uh, sort of the PayPal of SSI. Uh, once you have a very fragmented market, you need to create all kinds of creative solutions to sort of solve the interoperability uh, issue. And um, uh, so some sort of consolidation in the market would have at least have some positive effects. Um, but of course, eh, in the beginning of a, a market that is still in development, uh, fragmentation is of course good to sort of um, yeah, steer innovation. And, but at some point, it needs to converge and uh, needs to work towards an interoperable playing field where yeah, you can use your wallets, plug and play for different uh, services. So... Um, those were all the conclusions uh, from our research. Maybe it's now good to look at our recommendations uh, to the Dutch government. That's, I think, what you've all been waiting for, what the, at least you are, Poppe, you're, you're smiling. Um, and the, the unclarity about how digital identity and the European legislations relate to each other. I think that is mentioned as one of the biggest barriers. So, uh, we feel it's very urgent also for the Dutch government to create clarity on what is their stance. How does the current digital identity vision, 
the Regie op Gegevens uh, program, but also the EU Digital Identity Wallet. How do they relate to each other? But also make sure that you combine it with an ambitious implementation program, because we've heard a lot of talk and there are a lot of experiments going on the last few years. But if we want to move to a more consolidated market, there needs to be action in one direction instead of multiple directions. Um, and that is, I think, the second recommendation eh, to work. If you want to work towards a more consolidated market, you cannot do it alone. Eh? You cannot set these standards by yourself. It's very important to seek the collaboration with those 90 parties that we mentioned in the landscape. Uh, there is a lot of knowledge, there are a lot of best practices, uh, things that work, that don't work. And if you combine those insights and uh, make shared decisions uh, and also make sure that you give that input to Europe, uh, where the EIDAS regulation and the toolbox are now being created, you can make sure that as the Dutch we take a leading role instead of a passive role where the standards come to us. Um, and the third and maybe also very important recommendation, uh, if you want to get the network effect in the digital identity and digital exchange landscape going, it's very important that the Dutch government uh, sort of speeds up their efforts to make verified data available so citizens can uh, reuse it in different domains. And that would really help Dutch economy as a whole or Dutch society as a whole um, and uh, would also benefit, of course, the privacy of the user. But I think the, the Dutch government really has the perfect opportunity to take a leading role and to create that network effect. So these were our recommendations. There are, is a lot more also in the report that will be published later. Um, yeah, and I'm ha happy to hear your thoughts and questions about this research. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, Thank you very much. Uh, so time for questions. <laughs> Specifically for Avia and Stera, and after that, there will be time for questions for all the other speakers you heard in this SSI track. So, questions. John Eric, <laughs> you are first. Yeah, not a question uh, really, but just a f some feedback. I mean, I think this is really valuable work, and I, I'm so looking forward to, to seeing the report. And How's your Dutch? Because it is in Dutch. Uh, can you translate it for me? <laughs> what, so so I d then I do have a question. When is the report available in English? <laughs> Good question. Now, if you want to call, collaborate, I think then that could be a topic. Uh, any more questions? Kun. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. So I understood from Sterre that this report was published the day after the wallets were announced. So uh, did the wallets uh, change your recommendations and if so, how? <laughs> yeah, we spoke at lunch uh, and I mentioned that we were sending out a report and then the day before we sent the report to uh, Wouter, it was on the uh, news that uh, the Netherlands will collaborate with uh, Germany and uh, Spain Finland. and Finland. Um, that didn't change our outcomes, no. <laughs> okay, no impact on the report. More questions? Yes. So first, thank you, very valuable information. Um, it's not a question about your work, but actually I'm wondering if you are aware of there's um, in any other country the same type of research being done around this topic. I know that in Sweden there's a postdoc who's also investigating this. Um, mm -hmm. She's more looking at the trust over IP and uh, the sovereign and uh, the DIV communities. And there she's conducting the same research, but that's not like really country-based. Okay. Um, and it's also only limited to the organizations that actually contribute to ah. these uh, standardization bodies. Okay, cool. Yeah, it would be interesting to know like from a European perspective yeah. also how this landscape looks uh, even outside of the... Yeah, Netherlands, because if we can extrapolate this fragmented landscape to Europe. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm a bit worried about, about the outcome of that research. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm hoping <laughs> at some point it will converge more. Yeah, I can shed a little bit of a light on that. We had another speaker, Daniel Dussau, who is the convener for the European Union, uh, the blockchain um, initiative, EPSI. EPSI, you've heard the word more often today, this afternoon. It's a European infrastructure with nodes, with the whole 
real hands-on operational technical part where parties who want to develop blockchain solutions can play around with and one of the purposes for EPSI was also to make the policy makers in the European Union, the legislation, uh, giving them a playing field also to, to see and to really feel what it is about blockchain. So that was a sort of lab. Um, and on top of that, we, so we have the nodes, the technical layer, but of course the business layer with the use cases and wallets is on top of that. We've seen the stack with Evo. Um, there is also the European Self-Sovereign Identity Lab, which is using EPSI as the technical layer. And on top of that, building uh, or inviting parties from Europe, from the market, like academia, uh, uh, inventors, uh, uh, companies, banks, whoever thinks they have a good invention on self-sovereign identity, either for the infrastructure technical part or for business cases and wallets, they get subsidized by the European Union and there's, I think, six to seven million euro you can gain by that. I'm one of the people who have to decide about this. So we had 100 applicants from various types of organizations, all bringing solutions for the problems like we've heard them from John Eric, challenges on the technical layer, uh, delegated authorizations, um, uh, registries for virtual creden uh, verifiable credentials. So I've seen uh, 100 of those applicants uh, program descriptions and they're also um, so you see that there is a leverage and there is money for that yet it's not all in production but a lot happens uh, also in a scattered manner and, and some of these companies they have 10 to 17 uh, different small things they uh, solve but the trend if you look at all these new in uh, development all these inventions all these improvements they are all looking at problems that we all know from the classical identity and access and authority and delegation uh, structures. The same problems come back when you move with uh, self-sovereign identity. And, uh, but yeah, okay, so people, really smart people are working on those. So, but it, my impression is it will take time for this to happen and there are more challenges that we don't have with a classical identity management because we have this holder and validator and issuer triangle. So governance and legal stuff is also very important. Um, if you want to know more about it, there is a website called ASIF Lab. You can Google that or we could send it to you. Uh, and you can see who were the parties that got money to make these uh, solutions and whose developments were assigned some budget and uh, one was very interesting uh, and we did give them their subsidies they're not doing an innovation but they were making their whole existing intellectual property open source and that was the sovereign foundation they got eu budget to document everything and switch everything to open source and since they are one of the very large companies contributing since long for self-sovereign identity this of course is helping the whole community uh, a big step forward that's one example and uh, yeah well a lot of business cases were also developed and uh, awarded a grant uh, and mostly in the atmosphere of academia and diplomas, uh, certificates, uh, notar notaries, of course, were very, is a very important... Uh, a lot is happening in Europe yeah, as well. That's all, and those are companies from all over Europe. Yep. Uh, um, the ones who have been awarded, that you can find them on the internet. Cool. And um, so that maybe it helps a bit to, to uh, make you a bit more... Uh, <laughs> um, less worried on the, the problems yeah, yeah. and I think there will be more money coming. At so least, the least there's energy in the yeah. topic so that, yeah. that's good to know. And, and it's all under a large program for the internet for good you know uh, um, because the EU wants a single European digital market and identity is key in that. It's not just AIDAS looking at that but also self-sovereign identity. Can I maybe take the opportunity also to raise, yeah, of course, there are probably more questions. Yeah, more questions. Maybe also good for the audience to, to hear a bit from Wouter Welling from Ministry of Interior. 
Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of putting you on the spot <laughs> yeah. here, but... No problem. What is your... What is, no, but I think that's maybe really that's that what's uh, interesting to the audience. What, what does the ministry take from this research? Um, I'm not... not uh, <laughs> well, I, I, I was the one, uh, the person um, on it, signing it? The, 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 the assessment and the, the research from the Dutch government. Um, what is going to happen is we're going to send it to our, our parliament. And, and what we are also looking at is the effect it will have that we share these recommendations to our government with the broader public. And, and I think it's important that when we say there, there are a lot of these challenges in this SSI landscape that have to do with, with, with growing maturity of these technologies and also with the legal issues, governance issues, um, that it's important we have a societal debate on that. And what I see now is that, well, I'm, I'm a coordinator of digital identity. I am very invested in this and I'm, I've been working on it for, for eight years. But um, on the top level, it's still something of just solve the identity issue. And I think the message is that there's more to that and there's public value to be gained and there's choices to be made. Yeah. And if that realization comes at the top level, I'm very happy um, and we can grow towards this idea that, okay, governments eat your own dog food. So if you issue, also verify the stuff you're issuing. Um, that's the third recommendation, but also do make policy choices in these things that the market is waiting for policy choices. Organize yourself. Yeah. Um, and well, I'm, I'm very happy with those recommendations. Um, and But well, we, we have a demissionary cabinet at the moment. Hopefully we'll have a cabinet who's willing to work on this uh, uh, when the report is being uh, handled. Yeah, thanks Wouter, yeah, that helps. So do we need a ministry of digital identity, of <laughs> cyber security? <laughs> There's a question, uh, a back question. There from Ivo. Yes, Ivo. Or Ivo, you may step forward. And the other speakers for today, you can come here because we will make it a plenary panel discussion now. We don't have chairs, <laughs> but uh, Ivo, you can start. <laughs> well, I, I did want to ask a question uh, first. I think the very nice report and the recommendations uh, very welcome. Uh, but also playing devil's advocate, maybe a little bit. Uh, I can see there's fragmentation, but if you maybe compare it to the rest of the identity landscape where we have the Edens, the, the, the DigiDays, the It's Me's. Could you not argue that this self-sovereign identity landscape is actually way more not fragmented and consolidated already because they work from the same standard of decentralized identifiers and verifiable credentials? Mm, yeah, but they don't really all work from the same standard and... Uh, uh, the, uh, like the DITCOM or the verifiable credentials. So mm -hmm. there is a fragmentation on a technical level as well. So, uh, but on, in the sense of being stored in a different blockchain or using a different issue, uh, like generation scheme, you mean? Or, or? Yeah, like if, uh, for example, different wallets uh, accept different types of credentials. So if you have a verifiable credential and you want to store it in an IRMA wallet, then that does not work, technically. Yeah, Irma is the one example that doesn't adhere to those standards, okay. I think. <laughs> so, uh, but okay, no, I just uh, wanted to put that on the table. I don't know how, how we're... Yeah, just, uh, yeah, we have one microphone, microphone to share. Uh, Larissa, you can come forward as well, uh, on behalf of Rabobank and John Eric. So we have the speakers, other speakers. Um, <laughs> yes? Do we have all of you? Uh, Peter, is Peter still here? Peter for Koolen? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and John Erik, if you know, I think we have you all lined up. Uh, and now it's over to the audience. Do you have questions to the other speakers, or do we do you have a nice discussion topic that you want um, to discuss about? Yes. Question. Yeah. It's it's maybe a, a generic question in this sense, but looking at what SSI offers and what it provides, how do you see that uh, being supported by the, 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 the tech giants of, of this world? Eh? They, they basically build their cases on, on the identity that they have and the data that they're acquiring, uh, like Google, uh, Facebook, Microsoft, whatever. Why, do they, why, why, why would they support this initiative from that angle? Because it's a little bit chick-egg problem. You can have an identity, you can create a platform for the identity, but if the 
applications that daily people use, uh, and these application owners are coming from the same vendors, if they don't support the standard, it will be yet another identity platform. How do you see those challenges? Okay, who wants to answer this one? John Eric. I can uh, do a start anyway. I think I'm marked already. So. Yeah, you're yeah. marked. That's so, right. I mean, that, that's one of the challenges being addressed by EIDAS 2, right? Where they want to, you know, say, well, European identity should be in a European responsibility, right? The state is responsible for issuing. The state is responsible for at least providing one free wallet to, to the citizens. So that's part of the, the answer, you know, doing this in the regulatory way. Um, it doesn't mean that these big players can think of something else and try to get into and it's, it's a hard problem. And even as, as you mentioned, that got me really scared. Uh, what if they decide, no, we don't want any SSI apps in our app stores. But for example, Microsoft is actually one of the, key, the main drivers of this field. Uh, so um, thinking of the name Kim, Kim Cameron. Cameron, Cameron yeah. actually. I've seen Kim Cameron at Cup and Charcoal for one hour sitting very closely with the sovereign CTO discussing how to solve this. No, he's in Pensionado. No, okay, true. but I think his legacy is still there. Uh, also here in uh, Microsoft in the Netherlands. So who is driving it? Are you? <laughs> <laughs> No, actually, so, hi, I'm from Microsoft. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so I do work in the identity engineering. I'm very close connected to the work that we're doing there. And actually, so there are a few other people that are driving that, but um, maybe interesting to know that a week ago we did a demo for Satya on verifiable credentials and decentralized identities. And he really saw it as one of the future things and said, like, this is something, this could be the next thing. We need to invest in this stuff, we need to experiment. Uh, so we got budget available to do so. Um, and also from a vision strategy perspective, for us it's also a learning process. So we started with a public preview on verifiable credentials. And by the way, on the slide, we actually do have a wallet, which is the Authenticator app. It's kind of a wallet and more stuff. But on that topic is what we see as well, and the feedback that we got during the public preview is that, um, so we made a few cho choices on the back end, like, where, what type of um, site tree implementation um, are we anchoring on a blockchain, which blockchain, all that type of stuff. And the feedback that we got is that a lot of companies are looking for a choice to what do we want to use and also from a wallet perspective. And for now I can say that our vision and strategy with distributed identities and especially wallets is that we set the goal for within now in a year to at a minimum support three different other wallets with our services. Um, so that's where we're going right now. So um, I, I really like hearing the feedback and also like hearing like that we're gonna close an app store and all those type of things, which I can totally understand could be a possibility, right? If you look into um, other app stores and even, even probably our app store, which is a different division, um, it could be a possibility, but I can tell you from our vision and strategy on, on our platform, we're definitely looking into um, giving people a choice uh, if it comes to like what, how do you want to anchor it, where do you want to anchor it, maybe you want to use something different than a blockchain because I, it's also nice to hear the confirmation here that maybe that's not only the solution. And then from a wallet perspective, we're, we're really much looking for how can we adhere the open standards that are there and, and which wallets um, would, be, would be a nice candidate for us to partner with and make sure that our service, because in the end, um, of, of course, Microsoft, in the end, we want to make money, we want to have our stock going up. I'm not sure if it can go any higher at this point, but still. Um, uh, and, and for us, how we are in this game is that we're looking into, okay, so if you're a company and you want to do something with distributed identities, but you don't want to run your own nodes, you don't want to set up all the technology, we as Microsoft can offer you a service, and that service probably has, has things you can choose, like what do you want to use, and we can provide you a service. So that's basically how we're in the play right now. Um, just a little disclaimer, these things can all like change and maybe someone else steps in and thinks this is a bad idea, let's switch it. But for now, this is the vision and strategy we're following uh, if it comes from a decentralized identity perspective.
So that's an interesting add-on. Thank you for that. Uh, we hadn't reckoned with you, <laughs> uh, but it's good to know. Uh, any more questions to anyone else uh, from this panel? No, it remains a bit quiet. Yes, Kun? Yeah? So, uh, as there are some SSI experts here, uh, I'm wondering what should be the standards that are going to be adopted by EIDAS? What do you think should be in there? Is it going to be the W3C verifiable credentials and DITs, or is it going to be something else? Technical question. Yeah, Who technical has question. most? <laughs> Who would Nobody? like to raise their bet? <laughs> okay, anyone from the audience? Who has an answer to that? Well, I know I mean, that. Oh, John. I, mean, I mean, these are really hard questions. I mean, <laughs> back in, in the 80s when I started development, I worked with probably the best email standard called X400, right? Which had, you know, much better system for knowing who was sending emails and so on. And nobody's heard about that, right? Because SMTP was free and it took over and so on for reasons we really couldn't control. So it's not necessarily the best technology that wins. I mean, we had the same going to consumer electronics, like, you know, the VHS and beta videotape debate, same thing, you know, the, the VHS one because you can rent porn monies on it and, you know, the beta I couldn't. So it's, it's re really impossible to see until we go a little bit further down the road which technologies will be, uh, yeah. be used. I, I know that Markus Sabadello from Austria, uh, Danube Tech, small company, uh, he has been working on the DIT standardization and interoperability across, I think, six different types of DIDs uh, from U-Port and, and various of them. So I know, yeah, from my experience and I've read these proposals that there are really smart people trying to bring this all together, to bring it also, uh, make it more standardized because they've also noticed that this fragmentation uh, will just create another identity nightmare like we have it in the classic world. Uh, and, no, yeah, so right, maybe that's good to know. Right, and also, I mean... I'm but also right. the bridging with other types of uh, technologies like PDFs, whatever, that you have to sign, you know. Uh, the old-style uh, world has to be bridged and should be integrated with the new SSI world. It shouldn't be two separate types of domains that are not interplaying with each other. So a lot of work is being done there as well. A does bridges. I've, these are the type of inventions that uh, the EU is supporting as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I was going to say, I mean, Microsoft has a lot of power in this as well, because if Microsoft decides, hey, let's go with standard X, then, you know, a lot of companies are going to follow that. <laughs> X400. <laughs> oh, <thank you>. Whatever. <laughs> yeah. No, you had X400, so. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, we don't know at this point, but so no. I think, sorry, yeah. I don't want to hijack the whole. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry, I've, I've no, sorry, I have to. So I think, and, 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 and this is the, the thing where there's no question about at this point internally is uh, verifiable credentials, that standard. Although, like, there are some things now around others that don't agree on some standards here and there, but that's why we also have a dedicated team that's only looking at um, how can we implement standards and how can we contribute to standards? Um, so we, we are in conversation with all, about all those standards. On the DIT piece, that's a totally different story. That's kind of open where we're now like, so we, we started with DIT Ion, um, mainly also because there are a few folks working with a Microsoft who maybe added some stuff to the Ion network. Uh, but now the question is, is like, uh, should we only support DIT Ion, or should we just open it up for multiple DIT types and just give people a choice? And um, I'm also uh, working with a few people on the guy, uh, or working to to add to give some advice and feedback on the Gaia X project. Um, and that's also where right now we're looking into maybe DIT Web, which has nothing to do with any blockchain, but it's just like it's a DIT document hosted somewhere could be a short-term, maybe intermediate solution until we figure out what we want to do with blockchain and which blockchain and which did. So we're basically kind of open at this point looking into where are we going? And, and, and this is also why one of the reasons I'm, I'm here to gather the feedback from here and take it back and, and, and tell the team like, this is what we see in 
the Netherlands slash Europe. That was the reason I also asked about more research. Because yeah. if I come back and say the Netherlands is doing this, they're like, yeah, that's that's yeah. nice for the Netherlands, but <laughs> what are they doing in Europe? Um, but just consolidating all that stuff, and this is definitely going to bring input to the team that's now looking into what the stand's going to be. Long answer, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you again. <laughs> I also want to add that uh, so, uh, sometimes you start about working on standards, and then it actually doesn't turn out right in the end. Uh, as an example, I worked on guardianship for quite some time, and when I joined the guardianship working group at Sovereign, there were a lot of ideas about wallet takeover, private keys, handing over when you have in need of a guardian, like when you have dementia or when you are sick and you want uh, AV to do groceries for you, for example. Uh, so when I started, uh, I'm a cryptographer from background, so I don't like handing over my private keys. So that's just a no-go for me. Uh, so by the end, it, uh, at this moment, now standards are being rewritten, so they actually allow for guardianship over verifiable credentials, or maybe just over credentials, uh, so that we can actually do that and not having this um, wallet takeovers, for example. So that's also a bit of a fortschrijdend inzicht, I think. So you're not now sure what you're going be, to be doing in two years' time. So, yeah. and, 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 and what would be the best way to um, consolidate this fragmentation? Would that be regulation and policies, cooperation, technology, standardization, or maybe yet something else? What's, uh, I will ask all of you. What's your uh, opinion, Peter? Uh, all of the above. All of the above? <laughs> no specific order? <laughs> it's not one, one yeah. Speed. yeah, you need all of them. Huh? All of them. Yeah, and, and who should take the lead in that? Government, no, just the whole coalition. Is a very important player, yeah. Not yeah. Uh, yeah. Michael, Michael. And John Eric. Yeah. So, um, no, I agree. I mean, it's it's uh, all the different. But I think what we've seen here, starting doing some experiments, getting some hands on with doing it, I think that's gonna gonna tell us a lot of, uh, of where we want to go. If yeah, what's your opinion? How do we manage the fragmentation? Uh, indeed all of the above, but I think it starts with the public-private collaboration where you sort of bring all the insights from the private sector and the public sector together. Because before you can decide on standards, you need to have a shared view on what, is, what works best for everyone. And, and uh, if that doesn't work voluntarily and it doesn't scale, then you can always uh, refer to uh, legislation and sort of have a more regulatory push. But... Uh, I'm a strong uh, fan of public-private collaboration and setting the standards together. Sounds like a nice conclusion. I, yeah, I obviously agree. agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Larissa, your opinion? Yeah. Microphone. Is working? Microphone. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes, I agree with uh, everything that has been said, but I think one important element is also awareness, uh, creating awareness on all of the different fragmentations, because once there's awareness, we can actually start from there. Uh, and then I think, uh, yeah, especially for the, f for the verifier side, once they understand that they should do it the right way, and as, as well as issuers, of course, uh, then uh, we already can make a change. I, I feel like it's a it's a, it's a huge change, of course, in this uh, in this world, basically, uh, where we can yeah create an ecosystem and create awareness. I think if we all spread the word, it will already help. So, yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay, and then the last, your opinion, Ivo. Yeah, it sort of gives a pressure that I need to say something very, very holistic as well. But I, I kind of just wanted to say what, what I would like to have for as working for the city, because now we find that we're making a lot of decisions, you know, about uh, do we use a blockchain, yes or no, and uh, which blockchain. All my architects are completely confused, uh, uh, and I would just like to have a infrastructure that I could build use cases on um, that is approved by that public-private partnership that we're uh, hopefully going to okay. set up soon. So if we leverage EPSI and have people solve the technical issues and the interoperability uh, stuff and the bridging with the old world, that would be a good foundation. And then collaboration, legislation and all of the above. Yes. Is that a good conclusion for this session? Okay. Um, well, let's close now. Um, thank you very much, all of you, for taking part. Thank you for being so patient.